in the meantime, while we're waiting for the first um, video, the world of bees, the bees that I've discovered photographs of from around the world, uh, I thought you might enjoy watching this USGS presentation about bees. It's uh, public domain, so uh, free to share. So, and I'll leave the uh, source link in the description in case you want to go and see where it came from. So enjoy. Well, y'all settle down now. <laughs> Well, hello. Welcome to the U.S. Geological Survey in another installment of our monthly public lecture series. It's delighted, delightful to see such a full house today. Um, I saw a preview of the lecture this morning, or this afternoon at lunch, and I know you will enjoy it. But as usual, before I introduce tonight's speaker, I have some announcements, because I want you all to come back and join us again next month. Next month, Larry Maston from our Cascades Volcano Observatory will be here um, talking about forecasting ash fall impacts from a Yellowstone super eruption. What he does is it's not only forecasting but also hindcasting with computer models and weather and wind patterns and how high in the stratosphere or whatever and he can actually model in a predictive way of what happens to a large volcanic ash cloud. So I think you'll enjoy that uh, lecture next month. It's really tiny print here. <laughs> After that, in uh, June, Lisa Marie Wyndham Myers will be speaking about mercury in the Yolo rice fields. Everybody know where the Yolo bypass is on the way between here, halfway between here and Sacramento before you get to, to Davis. They grow a lot of rice there. And uh, it's naturally their pick up mercury. And later in the summer, we're going to have um, we're going to be talking about unmanned aircraft and uh, its uses in science monitoring. So do join us uh, in the next couple of months. We promise to have good presentations. So tonight it is my uh, pleasure to introduce Sam Drogi. Sam uh, comes to us from Maryland, across the country. He's with our Pawtuxent Wildlife Center, so we're very fortunate that he was willing to fly out here and be with us. He spent most of his career at the USGS Pawtuxent Wildlife Research Center. In fact, before it was actually part of the USGS, it was part of Fish and Wildlife and, and so forth. Um, Sam has coordinated the North American Breeding Bird Survey Program. He's developed the American Amphibian Monitoring Program, BioBlitz, Cricket Crawl, Frog Watch USA, and he's currently working on the design and evaluation of other monitoring programs. And some of those might be familiar uh, program names to you because you're the kind of folks that like to get involved with citizen science projects. I know you guys. Um, and there's a lot of really fun things to be involved with. Um, currently, Sam Drogi is developing an inventory and monitoring program for native bees, and that's what we'll hear about tonight. He's developing an online identification guide for North American bees, and along with Eric Ross, he's reviving the North American Bird Phenology Project. So um, enjoy the photos tonight. They are especially spectacular. You will enjoy them. Please welcome Sam Drogi. I am talking now, you're hearing. Okay, well, look at that technology. Um, so I gave, as Leslie mentioned, I gave a lecture earlier today to the in-house scientists and things. And then, um, like most of you, <clears throat> when you have a lot of time and it's a beautiful day outside, you go outside and look for bees and, and catch them because, you know, that's what you do. 
And uh, so I, I went around the campus here and I looked at the bees that they had and their lovely neat and trim plantings, and including some native species. And then I went across the street to the Catholic seminary, which was sort of disheveled, but they had lots and lots of flowers and, and things like that. And I, I came back with quite a few bees, but I have to say that, and this is really feeds into the lecture, that the Catholic seminary had a lot more native bees than the uh, US Geological Survey. So <clears throat> it's not allegorical or anything, you know. <laughs> Federal government, Catholic Church. <laughs> not, I'm stopping there. Um, but I want to talk today uh, about bees. And as, again, Leslie mentioned, we do a lot of work of cert different kinds of surveys, setting up surveys. But I promise no statistics. So we'll just focus on some of the larger picture messages about native bees. You'll see pictures. Um, here, all of those are ones that our lab took. They're all public domain, and I'll have a, a uh, our Flickr and Instagram feed will be listed at the end, so you can uh, partake of those. They're all available for downloading, and we even have a book that the government allowed us to put together, the Bees of the World, so um, you can enjoy them at lots of different levels, but everything is free. So um, uh, isn't it interesting that as a society, we know an awful lot about birds. We know an awful lot about butterflies. We know a real lot about plants. And over the years, we've accumulated that kind of information. But um, we know almost, li no, I'm not going to say almost nothing, but we know relatively little about our native bee species. And uh, the interesting thing, to me at least, is that um, we could probably um, live quite well, or maybe we'll just say they're not nearly as important as bees, um, meaning that birds and butterflies are visually appealing, but not necessarily as ecologically important as uh, the bee species that you're seeing across the screen right now, a lot of which are very much related to the flowers they're feeding on. So I want you, as you're looking at these kinds of things, to think about all this diversity in uh, the uh, floral world and the flowers and the 75% of the species of North America that are native that are, uh, require an insect, mostly bees, to move their pollen from one plant or another to affect pollination. And so you have this counterpart, which you can see in the florist shop or in your gardens, between all these different colors and all these different sizes and shapes in flowers. Think of the bees as having an almost one-to-one -one correspondence with that. There's a lot more to the world of bees than you might think if you're thinking just about honeybees. And if you're thinking about these kinds of things, also think about the beauty that you see in flowers is really, for me, I'll just say for me, is also reflected in the bee species that we rarely spend time looking at because many of them are um, you know, much smaller than the size of a grain of rice or something like that. But when you get to look at them in full focus and in full, um, uh, uh, you know, magnified to this level, those are all sunflower pollen grains right there, um, they become equally as beautiful, I think, as the flowers that they help design. And one of the features about these bees that I always find fascinating, and this goes for flowers to some extent, although, you know, flowers are a little gaudy, I think, at the end of the spectrum, <laughs> is that, um, the, the, the palette that nature has chosen or somebody has chosen uh, to be anthropomorphic um, in bees is a very, you know, well done palette. Like there's not, I don't ever look at a bee under the microscope and go, man, these colors just don't work for me. <laughs> um, and so I think here we have an example of, um, you know, how we have received our values and our um, ideals of beauty, but in a, in a group that we have hardly looked at at all. So all these flowers, this is one of the spurges. This is a, something that you see all the time because you're picking it out of the cracks in the sidewalk and you're on your steps, but you don't really look at that. Those are little tiny flowers in there too, or if you do, you don't see them at this level. And this is here to point out that many of our bees, and they achieve quite high densities and even in, within your backyards, many of the bees are really, really tiny. All those little tiny weedy flowers or not so weedy flowers in natural areas has a counterbalance of little tiny uh, bees that are 
pollinating them and using them. And because they're small and pollen grains are rich in proteins and lipids and fats and nectar is lip rich in carbohydrates, it doesn't take that many grains to feed a baby bee. So their densities, despite the fact that we don't know much about them, can be quite high. Um, so we'll talk about that a little bit more and we'll talk about the relationship with agriculture, but I'm just trying to present this sort of a new way of thinking about something that I think a lot of us have thought about over the years in a very casual way. And the other thing I want to uh, point out is that these um, species um, split from our line 550 million years ago. So they can be thought of as little tiny aliens. Um, their architecture, their chemistry, their sensory systems, their bodies, um, the, um, how they're put together is extremely different from us. And I think that's a part of the things that we can re-wonder a little bit by looking at some of these um, pictures. So this is nature. Nature has designed things in basically two colors, green, chlorophyll, active kinds of things, and browns. And um, flowers are a extremely unusual and for us very attractive because of that unusualness. You go back into look at Neanderthal burials and you'll see that there's flowers are put in there because it is such a um, out of the ordinary feature of the environment. So even back then we were attracted to colors and that's only there because it's a long distance signal to bees. So bees are attracted to the flowers because bees are only, you know, a very tiny, tiny creature. And when they come out of the ground um, at the time of year that their plants are blooming, they have to connect with these flowers. And under a lot of circumstances, say outside of our gardens, flowers are actually a relatively uncommon phenomena. So the color is this long distance signal um, that has brought the two of them together. The bees don't have the app that says where, you know, where are the flowers right now. So that's part of the connecting theme. Um, so no talk uh, can really talk about native bees without contrasting it with honeybees. So the reason to bring up honeybees is because we've all grown up thinking about and learning and seeing at many levels from cartoons on down to um, it, uh, television shows about honeybees, and in a lot of audiences, this is pretty much the only bee, maybe they have an awareness of bumblebees or something that they're aware of, and I tell people, okay, if you think there is only one bee, then there should only be the flower. Um, so, but to put honeybees in context, many of you know, probably most of you know, that they're not native to North America, they're not even native to the hemisphere. They're largely an Asian group, there's six to 12 species, um, depending on who you talk to taxonomically, and they have a radical lifestyle for bees. So among the many thousands of species, which we'll talk about in a second, they occur at one far extreme. So the notion of um, their colonial lifestyle, the queen living for multiple years, the barb stinger, honey, um, waggle dances, hives, waxy combs, um, and pretty much right on down the list, you need to just drop all that because none of that really applies to our native species. They're doing very different things. And even though honeybees occur on a different continent, even in the Asian subcontinent where most of them are from, the European honeybee is just a straggler out to be to the west of the main core of all the honeybee populations. They're radical even for them. So this is not a good model. And I point out to people that if you look at this picture, it looks like that there's long hairs coming out of the eyes of the um, honeybee here. And that's, that's because there are long hairs coming out of the eyeballs of the honeybee. <laughs> Which is, none of our native species have that. It's part of this extreme lifestyle that they live, which is that they are doing long distance foraging and they have to, like many of you who I'm sure are long distance shooters, um, going out to the range every day, have to account for the wind drift of your bullets. I'm sure that's, isn't that what all of you do? <laughs> that this species also has to account for the fact when it goes 20 miles away in its foraging or scouting trips, it has to figure out how to get back. And so that's one of the many, many different kinds of features. If we went into the morphology, you would see there's many parts of the honeybee architecture that's different from our native species. So another part of it is that we have to think of honeybees as a commodity. 
So USDA is officially the federal agency in charge of honeybees, whereas US Geological Survey, while nothing that we really can say that um, we have the same level of responsibilities because it's not, wild bees are not commodities, that's how we separate things within the, the federal government. There's regulations and therefore there's accountability in terms of how are honeybees doing within the federal government. And till, to date, this is one of the contrasts I want you guys to sort of take home is that we know so little about the wild bees because until now we really haven't had concerns about pollination, which is really a combination between efforts by honeybees, which are placed sometimes purposefully, sometimes as feral colonies, and the wild bees that are present in an area to affect the pollination of our crop plants. And certainly, um, wild bees do most of the pollination of our native species. Um, but um, the, so USDA tracks uh, honeybee populations, and um, we're not going to talk about it in a lot of detail here. Um, you can ask questions at the end. But um, populations, in terms of absolute numbers, are relatively stable um, over the past two decades. About half of what they were, um, say, 40 years ago. Um, the big change is not in decline in absolute numbers. You can get as many honeybees as you want. It's a decline in the, or an increase in the mortality of the colony. So honeybee keepers, particularly commercial ones, have to replace their colonies a lot more frequently now. And what that indicates is the vulnerability to the system. And that's why native species have been increasingly looked at as filling in behind, not for honey, because they don't produce honey, but pollination. And we're learning an awful lot quickly. Again, we'll talk about some of this. OK, just some facts here to give you some brackets around what does it mean to be um, a, a native bee species. So worldwide, there's about 20,000 species with names. <coughs> And elsewhere, we estimate there's 20,000 still to be described. So if we look at this from the bird point of view, there really are essentially no more birds to be described except in very isolated circumstances, you know, hilltops of New Guinea that no one has gotten to, those kinds of things. Um, so we're about 100 years <coughs> behind where we are with plants, butterflies, and birds in just simple life history. Just look at the fact that we estimate half the bees don't even have a name, haven't been taxonomically described. So our capacity for understanding is very low, um, despite the, um, the high um, utility, I don't want to use utility, but the, the necessity of having these species around. And so when we talk about needing to shift to native bee species for pollination or a concern over their conservation, we're lagging behind in just the basic information. In the US, 4,000 species estimated to be there. Um, about 400 of those species, even within the United States, are estimated to be undescribed. There's not enough taxonomists to simply write up things. It's not like some of them haven't been found. So there are places within the West, in particular, that people haven't visited and have physically have not gathered a specimen. But a lot of them have been gathered, and people are aware they exist. Just the person that has to do the writing up and giving of the name doesn't exist right now. So this is the kind of level of, um, we, you, you know, you don't have that with plants and butterflies. Those, that work has been done. Um, diversity is highest in the Southwest. So the deserts of Arizona, California, and Texas is where all the diversity of plants are. The divisions of uh, ecologically by mountain range and climate and the fact that a lot of those places have been isolated have created a lot of plant biodiversity, and there's a lot of specialization within bees, and that has created lots of different kinds of um, bee species, too. Um, within any location, so it could be your backyard, or it could be a region, it could be a park, you have what I call access to over 100 species of bees. Doesn't mean that they are nesting in your backyard, because your backyard could be all non-native plants and a lot of turf, both of which are negatives in general for native species, and in contrast, you may have bees and even some native bees coming to your non-native plants, but you're missing huge components, which I'll mention in a second, of the fauna. But if you plant, or you have, more importantly, you allow parks and other regional bits of uh, native vegetation to survive, it doesn't take much. Bees are extremely tiny. No one's talking about reintroducing, say, bison to the peninsula. but the reintroduction or the permitting to stay around is really all about permitting the um, 
the suite of native plant species that exist within a region to retain, at least at a small level, and it doesn't take much. I'll give you an example. In Washington, D.C., well, Maryland as a whole and the region, we did a study the past two years looking at bees that use the vernal plants, the spring plants that occur in forests of different types um, before leaf out. So there's a specialized community of plants, trilliums, spring beauties, things like that. And then there's also a counterpart of specialist bees that only are gathering pollen. It's all about pollen for bees. Um, in those communities too, and we looked at where the patterns were, and we had an expectation that these uh, residual pockets of fragmented forest, only a few acres in size within Washington, D.C., would have lost like they have for birds. You don't find the warblers and things that used to be there, even though the tree and the plant component is still intact, but you do, it turns out, find the bee component. So they're relatively immune compared to birds and other kinds of large vertebrates, to the fragmentation issues which hit these kinds of environments. So it's really heartening to see that these species have good ability to disperse or to hunker down and retain because they're small. It doesn't take a lot of space. Your backyard, for example, can be quite significant in terms of, let's call it bee um, refuges or bee habitat. The bigger picture is you want to be working with the local parks and those kinds of places. Some context here, so estimated roughly 2,000 species of native bees in California, roughly 1,000 in Texas, in Maryland, where I'm from, about 430 species. And again, to illustrate the lack of knowledge, about 100 of those species weren't on a list of Maryland that you might form, um, you know, let's say, 15 years ago before we started. And we added those 100 simply because we were the only people with boots on the ground throughout the state. Um, that's like, you know, you don't see that kind of thing with bird watching, you don't see that kind of thing with butterfly watching, and even the people who now look at odinates, the dragonflies and damselflies, don't see that large of a fraction, a third of the species as not being even listed. So again, a lot to, to learn. The UK, as a sort of an interesting contrast, has only 250 species um, of bees. So we're rich in bees, and it, you know, it illustrates one of the reasons that we left the UK. In, in <laughs> as a, a side, as an aside of an aside. So um, one of the difficulties, and I won't talk about it a lot, but if you have an interest in learning more about um, bee identification, I can send you links to the kinds of guides. We have online guides to them. Warning, all microscope work, even bumblebees. But the, one of the things that compounds that, so we have 4,000 species, we really have 8,000 things that need to be identified because the string of identifications for the males is always different from the string of identifications for females. They look very, very different often. And there are cases, pro almost certainly still on the books, where a species is described um, as having one name, another species is described as having a different name, that's the male and that's the female, they're the same. People haven't even you know, figured that out yet. So there, if you're bored, there's things to do with bees. <laughs> Bird watching, come on. Um, so, a few more things. 20% of all the species are kleptoparasites, so they are like brown-headed cowbirds. They lay their eggs in a pollen-carrying um, species, and then bad things happen underground, because that's where most bees nest, um, and the parasitic um, egg hatches, and you know, there's some kind of cage fight going on. It usually doesn't go well for the host species baby. I like to give talks about school kids and have them imagine themselves as the host baby, and then the monster comes out of the wall. <laughs> the teachers, for some reason, are not as happy about that talk. <laughs> but the kids enjoy it. The nightmares later is just is not my problem. Only about 1% of the species are not native. Not so much an issue now, but a rising issue in that more and more species, we track them roughly as we find them, are coming in. And now, in a couple of the species instances, they're the dominant member of a fauna. So like ladybugs and several other groups of insects, we now have issues with invasives ourselves. Uh, what's going to happen? Almost none of that's been studied, so we're just kind of documenting things in some ways. 
This is an important one, one of the most important aspects because it leads to how you think about the conservation of all of our native species, how you retain that capacity to use these species if something changes or we need to involve them in agriculture because we no longer have access to the very convenient honeybee, which is that about 20 to 25 percent of them are pollen specialists. That is, the mom bee feeds her babies only pollen from one species of plant or one genus of plant. And it's really interesting, and I give whole talks just on this, you know, it might be cactus plants, it might be um, willow, it might be, um, you know, uh, you can, we can pickerel weed, it can be wetland plants, and there's a whole variety. The big difference is it's mostly not woody trees. They, they have generalist bees of the native kind, and a lot of our perennials and small shrubs have highly specialized species. So you can probably do the math. You remove that component of plants from the ecosystem, those bees go right away. You don't have those plants, you don't have those bees. It's pretty much as simple as that. Um, surprisingly, um, some of the specialist bees are, are specialists on the very plants that we use uh, for food. So the um, species like um, the squashes, so pumpkins and the, the bigger gourds and things, not the bigger, not the gourds, but the, um, the larger zucchinis and those have specialist um, bees that only go to those. Those are North American species out of the Mexican highlands. And also um, sunflowers. So sunflowers have probably something like seven or eight species that only go to sunflowers. Some of them only go to um, uh, certain members of the sunflower rather than say the giant sunflower which we use in agriculture. And others of the specialists occur all the time on those sunflowers um, in our agricultural fields. Um, about 5% are cavity nesters. So many of you are aware of mason bees or something similar about drilling holes in pieces of wood or um, getting tubes or bee boxes and insect hotels if you're really advanced and, and the crazy things that Europeans do to create these kinds of, of um, of sculptures of, for, of bee homes. Only about 5% of the species, sometimes up to 10%, actually will use holes. Um, and sometimes those holes are the holes in the pith of stem, so the brambles, um, the prunings of raspberries and blackberries are excellent places for the minute carpenter bees. And, and you know, I have to kind of restrain myself from getting too far into the natural history for all these groups because there's too much to cover. But just to give you some brackets, and to point out, at, by contrast, that the bulk of species are ground nesters. And these are, I can guarantee, these are nesting in your yards right now. They're small, they don't defend their nests, they're all, so, almost all, or almost all, except for the bumblebees, solitary moms, and they, you have no real interaction with them. You can stand right on top of their nests, or even if they aggregate, you could be in the aggregation and the males might all be flying around. And they have the last thing on their minds is to sting. You're not allergic to them either. So you're allergic to the social um, uh, hymenopter. So you're allergic to honeybees and you're allergic to um, yellow jackets, which as an aside, so someone, now you're, edu I'm educating you right now. The, if someone comes up to you and says, you know, I was mowing my grass or doing whatever, pulling weeds and all these bees came out of the ground and stung me and stung my darling child or whatever, then you can tell them, no, those are not bees because they are never bees. It's always yellow jackets. So the, um, but you know, if you look at a yellow jacket, it's like the cartoon coloration of a bee, of a honeybee. And honeybees, you know, are basically a lot drabber than they show in cartoons. So for the average person, a yellow jacket is a bee and it is stinging them. But you know, bees are getting a bad rap for the yellow jackets in our lives. Most are ground nesters, most prefer, almost all prefer something other than turf to nest in. So um, a little bare ground somewhere within your garden or in your yard is a good thing. Sometimes difficult to do aesthetically. That's a big issue is how to make the kinds of things I'm talking about into an aesthetically appealing change in how the landscape looks. Native bees can provide the bulk of pollination. Now there certainly are instances and the classic example, and perhaps the one that is most difficult to transfer, is the almond crop in the Central Valley and to California as a whole. Uh, that species of tree came from, uh, I don't believe it's the Middle East or, the, or perhaps the Near East, and it blooms very early in the year. 
and most of the native species are not active at that time of year. Most native species come out for a, a brief period of time, not throughout the year, and they are, are locking into a native plant species or group of species. And February is not when there's a lot of action, so there's very few native species out at that time. Makes it difficult to do any kind of pollination um, other than honeybees, um, although people are looking at that. Elsewhere, almost all the other crops are really this intermix of native species and honeybees, even if you have honeybees present within the system. And now that we've started looking at this more, in the past we just, it was a guinea. Almost no, never was there a pollination issue in terms of your crop problems were elsewhere. It wasn't pollination. And so because it wasn't much of an issue, it was relatively little studied, and we didn't realize that in almost all crops, native bees are, are supplementing or adding or the primary pollinators, even if the farmer can point to the box of bees that he purchased or allowed the honeybee person to be in there. So as things become more vulnerable with honeybees, um, these are our replacements, and what we're trying to do is learn how to manage the landscapes uh, for promoting the native species to come into the crops, because that's mostly what they're doing. Almost, and it would be rare that the bees, because of the way the agricultural fields and the orchards are managed, can really make it within the orchard or crop environment because it's relatively toxic and highly managed for that species um, things. There's plenty of room for organics and other things, but when you plow up the land, you're plowing up bees' nests at the same time. So, um, uh, so in agricultural point of view, because of these vulnerabilities, what we're looking at is that throughout the country you have different as I just showed in terms of just the number of species that are, occur within different regions, you have different groups of bees with different capabilities. The bees themselves have different interests in different kinds of plants based on the plant's architecture and what the female bee is interested in providing her young with in terms of pollen. So that all makes it much more complex than bringing a box of something out into a field. So uh, again, we're beginning to look at this more closely and it brings up the fact that we need to learn more about this uh, group uh, of species. And also we have to be more careful about retaining those groups so that we have access to them as we shift in our agriculture and an important set of pollinators um, perhaps disappears from our um, area. So different crops different have attract different species, different geographic areas have different species. So it changes even within a state and even across a relatively small reason, region just um, hundreds of miles, if not tens of miles, have different bee communities. Um, so another interesting thing is that traditionally, if you talk to a farmer, there's sets of, of flowering plants like cotton, uh, soybeans, and peppers that are, um, they would tell you, are self-pollinated. And indeed, they don't have to have a pollinator of any kind visit those flowers to produce a crop. But what it turns out, though, is that in all three of those cases, relatively recent work, again, because there was no real need to do this, shows that when those crops, soybeans, cotton, and peppers are visited by a bee for whatever reason, the yield goes up. So that's an interesting perspective and has gone up. Every single study has shown this. So with cotton, it's, you know, bowl weight. With um, soybeans, it's yield. And with peppers, you know, it's bell size or whatever the measurement of peppers might be. And um, so if you think about agriculture, um, you realize that most of the effort is, you know, taming pests, increasing uh, uh, capacity and uh, productivity per acre. And most of that's been with fertilizers and pesticides and um, herbicides and GMOs and however you want to slice it. And no one has just said, well, if you had more bees, you basically have, you know, free money. So here's a place in a, in a system that probably has, is getting plateauing, although who am I to say, I mean, in terms of its capacity to increase yields and simply by interdigitating uh, back into that system bees. And all these studies have primarily been looking at native species that happen to be in the margins of fields and around the edges. Now again, I should point out that highly, highly industrial areas, i.e. the Central Valley, have issues with this because they have lost all their capacity in most places for retaining native species because everything is laser leveled and used or ditched and clean cultivated 
um, whereas when you move out of those regions, you have hedgerows, you have um, stream valleys, you have the borders of fields that are woods. That's where the native bees are. Um, native bees have high productivity too, and they just simply move into the crop. Um, they're not going to get into the middle of the soybean field, but if you take, for example, the grassy strips that are used for erosion control and make them change them from grass to forbs, then you're increasing the likelihood of um, increasing your yield because bees would move into those areas too, as long as you keep the pesticides out uh, from knocking out those um, those, <coughs> those uh, strips. And additionally, Ames is doing a lot of work with those strips because it turns out forbs, i.e. blooming plants, do a better job of retaining the soil, which was the purpose of those things to begin with, than grass, which grass simply flattens when water goes over it in these big rain events, which is where most of the, all right, you know, I'm taking too many asides here. We're going to be here forever. So we'll stop with the erosion thing, but bees good. You know, there's part of my message. All right, so... Uh, to, um, to kind of put things in context, a lot of you through the media have, I think, the impression that uh, bees are in trouble. So certainly honeybees are in trouble in terms of their vulnerability. Again, we don't see the absolute change in numbers, but if you're a farmer and you need to purchase your bees or rent your bees or however the monetary thing, over the last few years, it's quadrupled in price. So that's gone up. Um, but the implication has always been that the native bees also have the same thing going on, that they are the same uh, pathogens that are whacking, um, uh, honeybees are whacking the native species. And this is not the case. There's some overlap and there's some interesting new work looking at some of these diseases as maybe at least being passed on by native species. But this is the good part of the radical extreme lifestyle that honeybees have, which is because of the way their system is set up, the pathogens and the pests have to very much lock in and adapt to that system in honeybees. And that's, that's, um, that doesn't translate to the native species because their life cycle, which is basically, I lay my eggs in an underground nest and I seal them off one at a time in a little cell and then I walk away, has these huge differences in breaks and the diseases and the pests are quite different between those members. So we don't have the honeybee issues um, there. So it's really difficult to ascribe problems that honeybees have to native species. And then the other part is that we know, we have no monitoring. We have no Bureau of Census for native bees. I can't give you any figures. I can't give you any stats. I can tell you how to monitor them if you wanted to find a mechanism to um, purchase the you know, ability of a, a lab like ours to do the identification. But right now, we're sort of in the dark. This is as best as we can do. So we talked to the handful, and I literally mean a handful, of bee experts in the East, and we said to them, and we published this, this is our, my great um, contribution to science of uh, status of native bees. They said, okay, over the last 20 years, which of these bees have you seen on the list of all bees east of the Mississippi? And they just were like, yep, saw one of those, saw one of those. And then we had, there were about 800 species, and there was this list of 37 that was left over. These had not been seen by any of the handful of experts. And it turns out the, the thing that, um, the common theme among all of those is that they all were really rare to begin with. So there weren't many records. It wasn't like a, a bison situation where we had tons of them and now we have none. It was a situation where, well, they always were rare, and it turns out, since the paper was published, about five of those species have been found again. But there are so few people looking that it's just a rare event thing. Um, <laughs> it could be even locally common, but in any state, you know, there might be, the average might be one person really working on native bees, and most of the time they're working in an agricultural system. So our ability to detect anything as simple as whether that species still exists or not is extremely low. Again, think about plants, butterflies, and birds, and the whole communities of people who are constantly searching for them because they love doing that as uh, a contrast, and we can't even come up with a proper list. The other aspect which shows this uh, component of taxonomy as an issue, we not only have missing species, we have some suspect species on the roll. So back in the day, it took you to say that you had a new species, you basically, you have to do a publication. I think this is a new species, here's my name, someone reviews it, it gets published. 
things were a little different back 100 years ago. So it would be, you know, if Crawford said he had a new species, people said, okay, you know, he must know what he's talking about. He would write a paragraph that described that species. And then you set aside a, a type specimen and to unvalidate that, well, first of all, your description is far too weak because there's many species that probably look just like that and they're vague. I can tell from first-hand experience. And then the second part of that is that the type specimen might be destroyed, or it might be dirty, or it might be ambiguous, or more likely, no one's looked because there aren't that many people who look at these kinds of things. So a lot of the other species on that list may simply be species that already exist and that um, species needs to be disappeared, or the males and females are not matched up. Um, but again, I'm going on too long about individual topics um, <laughs> that I find extremely fascinating, but probably of less and less interest as I go along. So um, the bottom line is that is pretty darn poor in terms of wanting to know what the status of native bees are. We just ask people, have you seen it? And, um, I, and I just find that humorous that in a, a land that has um, NASA sending up, I think, 36 satellites that circle the globe and measure all this, um, the the chemistry and look at Landsat and all kinds of other kinds of things, and we're spending billion dollars a year on that, that we can't even figure out whether we have these species or not, and we can't even give them names. I mean, the reality is if you ask the average person, which is more important, I think they could figure it out. Um, but it's safe up there in the satellite land, you know, there's, you don't really have to deal with a lot of details. Um, so here's what we do know. We do know that because we have lots of good data on birds, even though the birds are not really important, as I pointed out earlier, um, <laughs> that I can say that because I used to run the breeding bird survey. We have things like this. So bobwhite quail, which is an open country species, and it's using the kind of environments that we had more commonly, which are rather loosely farmed, lots of weeds. The fields were a mixture of crop and weeds. and um, the roadsides were very open. We lived in a landscape that had lots of capacity just because we didn't have the capacity to make it all neat and tidy. And so what we see is things like this. We see red as areas of decline and blues are areas of, de of uh, increase. So um, it's pretty clear that bob whites are tanking. And I can give you lots of individual examples. They're declining everywhere except in parts of Oklahoma and Texas where rangeland is being invaded by brush another issue, but in a, with a different flavor, and that's favorable habitat for bobwhite quail. Um, not so favorable for some of the rangeland management, but that's simply the way the, the um, situation turns. This could be uh, a map for you know, the basic understanding of native bees in the east or in that part of an environment. Um, and the reason is that uh, we've gone from, these are just some of the agricultural shots from Maryland in the past, and you can see and you can um, you know, stick in whatever region of the country you want for these kinds of things. The place was a radically different in terms of how we managed our lands. We didn't have access to herbicides. We didn't have access to um, brush hogs. We had um, you know, manpower and we had a lots of different kinds of grazing animals and we had multi-diverse farms and we lived in scattered lots at very relatively low levels and we certainly impacted the landscape greatly, but there was lots of re residual areas where native plants could exist. And so we have lost a lot of that and a lot of it has to do with some other big changes that have occurred over that same time period. One is that there's a big increase in, in invasive species. So as these invasive species come in, we don't, they don't ratchet out other ones. So we're not ratcheting out an old set and bringing in a new set. They're taking over big parts of this um, laissez-faire um, roadside or places that were not actively management environments. And a pattern exists that um, because of the specialization, but it doesn't all, so bees are on a continuum. So we have highly specialized species and we have species that we would call generalists, but no bee species or any group, even honeybees, which is perhaps the most generalist of all the bees, um, has, finds all flowers to be equally tasteful in terms of nectar and pollen visitations. So it's just a matter of extreme. Some only go to one family, some only one species, some one genus. 
Um, and others, just like honeybees, are a good example. Honeybees really turn their noses up about cranberries. If they're going to do cranberries, it's like that is the only thing left in the whole universe for them to do. And they will visit cranberries, but they won't like it. Um, so a lot of times when farmers put um, their hives in cranberries, the bees all leave and find some place, you know, <laughs> three miles away to forage on. And the bumblebee species, which are love cranberries and know how to sing the right uh, sonication songs for them, and the other native species move in to the, what is a native species for uh, that group. And we could go on. So we're losing big chunks of this um, landscape that we're not using to invasive species which don't support um, much in the way of diversity. So they do support, you can think of yellow sweet clover, which is not a native group, highly attractive to honeybees, and then a few of our generalist bees. The analog here would be to say, you know, we're doing okay with birds because I put out a bird feeder and I get a bunch of birds that come to those bird feeders. You know, sparrows, starlings, and rock doves. <laughs> and so no, you know, birder in their right mind and even the a uh, local person would say, that's fine. You know, we've now taken care of birds. Now we can get to take care of bees and we'll plant a bunch of yellow clover or any of the clovers, it turns out. Um, you are affecting the number of bee, bee product in an area, but it's mostly the common ones. You're basically providing bird food for common species that don't absolutely need our help. The conservation of bees is all about the native species and changing these mixes from um, the kinds of things you see in recommendations. And those are good recommendations because we don't have this kind of information on what the specialist bees and what the right kind of landscape should be for native species. And this is, again, part of this learning thing. We're just beginning to do that. And so we plant things that are highly attractive and easy to grow for seed for a generic scent of bees. So sometimes that's useful, particularly if you're a farmer. But the overall picture, a little more murky in terms of how that plays for the overall conservation of all the species. I should also point out this is another thing that native plant societies can use when they talk about why to plant native plants, is that you are providing uh, the resources needed for a set of bees that occur nowhere else except on those native plants. And to take that one step further, you're also providing resources for a whole set of other insects and you know microorganisms that only exist and it co-evolve with native plants in the region that you know as a society we don't really spend a lot of time thinking about pseudoscorpions or different kinds of flat bugs or um, you know aphids um, except maybe that we like or don't like the way they look but native plants bring all that with and you don't need to know all the details of which goes with what just plant a long bloom of these plants throughout the season, and you're already doing a good job. I don't want to discourage you, though, from learning the details. But, and so email me. You'll see it at the end, and I'll be glad to send you more information. Here's another factor. Vertebrates out here it might be wild pigs. Um, I'm not sure what your deer or rabbit or goat or fill in the blank of what eats things, eats plants. But I can tell you that in all those cases, they're, except maybe wild pigs, because they are from Europe. Um, but in all the other cases, the native ungulates, they don't go, wow, look at all these invasive species. They taste a whole lot better than the native plants. The opposite is the case. They, when they build up populations, they hammer the um, native plants, and then the invasives have yet another leg up to move into those areas because the competition from the native plants, which is often sufficient to keep them at bay, is now decreased because of high, you know, uh, fill in the blank ungulate population that's um, around there. Um, here's just a generalized uh, set of issues, which is that compared to, you know, even 50 years ago, we are wealthier, we are, there's more of us, and we are neater because, um, and I think this is a, a big thing for people to look at, we have an aesthetic that says everything should be very corporate lawn. Uh, in its presentation, and if you don't do that, you are a bad neighbor, and you are going to get the um, you know the hidden arrows of a public disdain sent your way. So I, I I throw this out that for the people who are now thinking, well, I can convert my 
lawn to native species or my meadow or whatever, you should be thinking about how to do that in an aesthetic way that's, pr that's palatable to your neighbors. You have to do it in a way that says, I did this on purpose, I am not lazy. <laughs> and you should like me. And then if you really want to be successful, you would have the, you would be the, the person or group that switches the whole paradigm and so that when someone has the corporate lawn, they are seen as the bad neighbor and the people with the native plants are seen as like, that's the status quo. When I come back, I want to see that happen. <laughs> um, clean cultivation. So agriculture is no longer really bee habitat in almost all its ways, despite many of the crops needing or being helped by having bees move in. This is just too heavily managed a, um, a piece of property. Good in some ways, right? If we didn't have this increased capacity on the, on the land to produce more and more food per acre, where is that food coming from? It's going to be in the loss of native habitats. Lots of layers of issues that we're not going to have time to go into, including pesticides. We could talk about that perhaps later. But the issues here are really different from the conservation of all native species because even the sides of these agricultural areas are highly impacted. They're going to be almost always mown or clean ditched. So the farmer um, has the same um, mindset, which is my fields look really good because I plant them and I you know, keep them clean and the weeds out, but I also mow everything. All my ditches have no, nothing growing in them. And in some of the places where you have food uh, borne pathogen issues, you know, the idea is like sterilize it so we don't have any animals moving into the spinach crop or whatever. So that is a separate issue because even if you had a good weedy verge or something, that's so disturbed that you're mostly getting your crow and sparrow bees again, which you want because those are effective pollinators in a lot of cases, but it's not the big conservation message. It's mostly just, again, I want to emphasize loss of good native habitat, native plants, rather than, you know, moving the deck chairs around on the Titanic of agricultural fields. Is that a good analogy? I don't, I'm not sure. Um, so back to whining about lack of uh, information about bees. So if we look at floras, so flora would be a publication of some kind of the plants of blah, blah, blah. And this is in Iowa. And the, that was a joke. OK, <laughs> never mind. Um, so um, the University of Oklahoma has put together a list of, um, uh, of floras. And there are over 2,700 of those. Um, prior to the last few years, when we've been more active, and we've produced a bunch of these too, the faunas, so the publication of a list of the bees of a place, there were somewhere between 10 and 20, period. That's it. So orders of magnitude fewer of uh, those. We actually, actually have a list of all those. So again, I'm just documenting how little we know. So there's just not enough people going out and learning. That's, we learn very inefficiently. We need tons of botanists to bring up the, the raise the general level of understanding about plants. Butterflies, odonates, birds, same thing. Efforts of many people. And the many people just aren't there for bees right now. Um, every state has multiple bird books. So by that I mean go back 100 years and bring up to the present, there's on the average is three or four state bird books, the birds of Connecticut, one, two, three, and four. Every few decades, someone publishes a new one. And we've actually used that to track changes in bird populations. They've been so intensely done. Um, there's one publication that is a state book on bees, and that was the uh, bees and other stinging aculeates, so uh, wasps and ants and um, its related kin. Um, so Connecticut, that's the place to be, I guess. Get it? That was a, I didn't even mean that. Um, so um, uh, if we look in the United States, again, whining a little bit more, there's fewer than 10 people who really could be given a collection of bees that were collected from your backyard or any other place and then go through and identify them all. Irregardless of whether there's taxonomic problems, there's just not enough people who have that natural history understanding. And guess what? Almost all of them have retired. They're still doing bee identifications for people because that was their passion. They were the only ones left because all the rest were let go by, now I'm really whining, by universities and the museums that have also disappeared um, because of 
um, what society expects. So one of the things that I offer, and I'm winding up here now, is that um, if we want to do something here, we need to, in a way, be bringing back this taxonomic expertise. We need to have voucher collections. This is why we do these high, high uh, detailed pictures to act as an online museum because the access to the graduate students and the researchers who are doing bee investigations is that in order to do your identifications, um, other than giving it to one of the fewer than 10 people who are overwhelmed, you have to at least compare your results to a known specimen. And those known specimens are disappearing simply because museums are disappearing um, as someone decides, well, we need to cut funds. Well, it's pretty easy because um, taxonomy is not sexy. It doesn't get you tenure. And it seems like, oh, we don't need to do that anymore. Um, but the reality is, is that's the basis for a lot of our understanding. We need to bring back, particularly for bees, because it's a collecting phenomena. There's moral issues that we can talk about too, but you simply can't identify all the bumblebee species by looking at them or taking a picture. Um, and the small bees, you can just forget about it because of the difficulty in um, tracking their numbers. By visually, you just can't tell them apart. Um, so native bees, native habitat, on high quality native habitat, that's your reserve in any particular region. You need a lot of them because the bees are very variable. The, the bees on top of the mountain ranges here are different from the ones in the valley. Uh, the ones um, in, as you go west to east, are hugely different. Um, so um, I argue that uh, because of all these factors that are moving us to a more and more locked in landscape, this is where people live, these are where um, row crops are, and you don't have that dynamic. People used to live here, and now they're gone, and now these were farmlands, and now they're forest, and now they're back to farmlands, and we're doing things in a very casual way. Um, we have to be much more conscious. So it's a decision that needs to be made as to how landscapes are used, and we can't just take uh, on the, um, uh, assume that things will be okay um, just simply because they always have been that way. I think we are moving as a society into a, a much more polarized set of habitats um, and um, we're still growing. So we're going to claw that out of the wilderness and we have to be careful and we have to think about which chunks of land stay and which uh, chunks of land can be used. And I mentioned this before, I think there's this aesthetic thing too. We can do an awful lot if we simply change what people find acceptable in terms of how a landscape looks in and around our homes and highways and just think of transmission lines. So a big distributional transmission line, you know, one of these 500 kV things that are moving our electricity around from our wind power and whatnot. Um, and our solar panels, which are, you know, are sprayed so that there's no native plants under them. Not that I'm whining about solar panel um, <laughs> arrays. Um, those places, I can guarantee, a transmission line through suburban habitat is going to be mowed every two weeks or whatever the counterpart is in some of these drier areas because that's what the local community wants. So it's your guy's job to look at shifting those kinds of aesthetics. And that's in some ways more important um, than some of the other factors um, that we have because those are opportunities. Those don't have to be mowed uh, areas. They can be some of the most valuable ones because one of the few landscapes that has to stay open. Um, so hug your taxonomist um, and <laughs> think about monitoring programs so that we can increase the natural history understanding of the different bee species that we have in our regions because as I pointed out multiple times, if you weren't paying attention, we're in deep trouble in terms of just fundamentals. Um, so this is the second to last slide. For those of you who are interested in our pictures, and there's links to our picture taking um, videos and whatnot too if you're interested in the technique, um, you can go to Flickr and you can download all those pictures. You can download all the pictures in our book at the original, um, the, uh, you know, the most, um, uh, what am I trying to say, high definition um, pictures are all there. The ones I would give you, I would just give you by downloading it myself. They're all free. You don't have to acknowledge us if you don't want to, and you certainly don't have to ask our permission. And you can track us now on Instagram and have a picture or two a day of some cool bee. And we try to blog it a little bit. You know, what is that species, and what does it do, and why is it cool? 
and what cool thing happened when we were collecting it. Um, so feel free to um, tap into that as much as you want. Um, there's my email address. Um, for those of you who are um, thinking about some of these more technical details, I know there's probably a few of you who study bees or would like to study bees, um, you certainly can get in touch with me and we have lots of links to those things. Because this is designed to be a general audience, I haven't gotten into any statistics or how to count bees or the trapping techniques or how we think about monitoring. Those kinds of things are available and if you want to learn, you know, we have lots and lots of tools for that too. And that's all I have. Do you have time? Time for questions? Yes. Okay. Thank you, Sam. I'm sure most of you, you always have questions every month, which we're delighted. And Sam's good at answering them. In case you haven't been here before, we have two microphones. We've got them set up on stands in each of the two aisles. I would appreciate it if you're able to, to walk up, stand in line, and walk to the microphone and use it. Not only so that the people in this room can hear you, but we uh, stream these live on the internet. So other people out around the world want to be able to hear the questions as well. And we'll go back and forth. If for some reason it's difficult for you to get to one of those microphones, then just wave at me and we'll f I'll come to you with a mic. But we already have one person with one question. Why don't you go ahead, sir? Is it um, on? It might not be on. You could shout. <laughs> no, it should be on. Mitch, is that mic on? This, yeah. you, this one you, you probably have a loud voice, so. I, I actually do. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> microphone's usually on, my friend. Uh, where do you fall on the mulching question? Are, are the mics? Uh -huh. Are the mics on? Are the mulching the mulching on? Well, it turns out Repeat that. The question? Uh, Oh, so the question is the, the mulching question. So I only get this out here, but um, it, it does have a generalization. Um, so should you put down mulch, um, and how much does that attract or repel some of the nesting species? So many of these nest in the ground. There's a set of bees that nest in rotting logs, and mulch is the perfect sort of habitat for them. The problem is, is that it is only a very small number of species that actually prefer the mulch. So in general, you want to have some bare ground for them to nest in. But again, it's a bee, they're really small, so it doesn't take much bare ground. And so like a, a path where you tread near your water faucet or the overhangs in your house where it's a little drier, um, or um, you can do what, there's the only study I know of that actually looked at increasing the amount of um, nesting habitat um, for ground nesters, um, they simply rototill a, a little patch out of the turf or the lawn. I realize that a lot of people don't have necessarily um, the kind of landscape in their yard to um, do these kinds of things, but if you can sneak a pile of dirt or a, a bare area somewhere where aesthetically it's okay, that's a good thing. And remember, they're bees. They don't, it doesn't take a lot of habitat. You know, something this big is like bonanza for them. You should be able to find some place to put it in. Or they'll nest in your neighbor's yard, who never took care of their yard anyway. <laughs> or under the kid's play swing. Good place. Okay. Um, oh, this is a good one. Um, the Argentinian ants that are invading California, has there been any studies about how the bees, the native bees are affected by this invasive species, species of ant? Not that I'm aware of, which doesn't mean that there hasn't been those kinds of studies, because I know I've heard the studies about how they affect native ant populations. But one would suspect it's a problem, but I really don't know of any studies. But I could f you say that for lots, in terms of studies, lots and lots of the aspects of natural history of bees. So we don't even know, for many of these species, we've, no one's ever described the nest to begin with, let alone how it interacts with an invasive ant species. But that's a, a good point. My que I actually have two questions, and the first you have sort of answered, and that is um, the, you know, the best kind of habitat that we could provide, um, say in our gardens or our lawns, is that bare dirt, just plain bare packed dirt or tilled dirt, or, or what is it exactly that they really like? So I'm not advocating that you turn your whole yard into a, you know, a bare patch. 
Um, no. But hard packed dirt is, is um, so different species have different soil type preferences, so it's really difficult to be exactly prescriptive. The idea is to not, um, not augment your turf to a, uh, the ultimate level. So in most cases, if, and again, I'm just not from this area, so I don't have this thing, but back home, if you were a kind of like, I mow it uh, person, and that's the extent of your turf management, you have lots of bare patches in your lawn anyway, because things <laughs> get thin for a lot of different kinds of reasons, and then everything's completely fine. Mm -hmm. So I would suspect that there's, and for lots of people who are already caring for their lawns with lot, or their yards with replacing their lawns with native plants, that there are just spots in there that are automatically bare, and it doesn't take much. It just has to be a thin area. Thank you. Then the other question is a very specific, is about vicane which is used here um, to kill termites. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, is that a biocide that also affects the bees? I don't know. I don't know anything about Viking. Okay. So, Thank sorry. You. If it, but I could, in a very gentle way, if it's an insecticide, um, it's probably, it will kill bees, unless it's one of the, you know, BT kinds of things, which are specific to a certain group. So if it's yeah, a pesticide, no, it's <laughs> if they intersect, however that is, then um, it's going to be a problem. If it's a soil application, for example, and you have bees digging through the soil, that's it for them. It, it, it's applied to houses, and then they tint the houses, and then they uh -huh. release. Oh, so it's a fumigant. The, it's a fumigant, and then yeah. they release the I don't the think tent. that would be probably much of a problem. OK. Yeah. Thank you. Hi. Are you familiar with Gretchen Laboon, the Great Sunflower Project? I know Gretchen well, yeah. Great, thanks. Do you say you see anything about that? Is that because it's a social data gathering thing? Is that if you just talk about that a bit? Yeah, and you know, you might know more. In fact, I texted Gretchen to see if she was going to be around. She goes, Argentina. So oh. I, <laughs> okay. I believe that wasn't code for anything other than I'm in Argentina. Um, so I believe the program's still running. Yes. Because their funding had ended, but it sounds like it's continuing. They just sent out a new request for surveys. So yeah, they're okay. at the end of the month, I think. Yeah. yeah, so if you're interested, it's a good way Thanks. to learn something about bees without getting all obsessed about all the taxonomy and the species and the things I'm whining about. Um, because they simplify things. Instead of going like which bee species it is, it's categories of bees and you are using standardized sunflowers, which is a certain varietal of it, and they have a procedure which you observe the bees, and then they look at the relationship between the number of bees counted and what's going on in your yard, your neighborhood, your area, and associations with, uh, <coughs> excuse me, the uh, chemical, um, you know, things going on in the, in the fields nearby. So it's actually a very valuable study, and one of the few that can involve pretty much anyone right now, um, because again, it's not a bird watching butterflies through binoculars situation because most of the things we do is collect specimens and someone else has to ID them. In the future, if we were to project out, we would probably be doing molecular stuff, which would up the need to have individual groups be doing these bee collectings. But right now, uh, it's most, the, the uh, um, Great Sunflower Project Gretchen Laboon is the, the way to go for doing things. Rats, the, that was my question. Uh, it was actually, um, I, I really enjoy insect morphology and I did a bunch of bee collection and identification in college. Really fun to get in a microscope and do that, but your call for more taxonomic or morphology experts versus just grinding them up and sending them to a lab, while dark and sort of bleak as a future, it does seem like a really efficient way to make that species identification. So can you give us a little bit of background on where cataloging these species is right now from a molecular point of view, from you know, genetic material? Yeah, we're actually playing around with the edges of it now. So at this point, you can take a, let's call it a bolus of specimens from a trap or wherever you've caught them and throw them into a robot and grind, they'll get ground up and sequenced and then all those sequences will be matched against databases that exist and it will tell you that here's a list of species, this is the robot talking, this is a list of species that we think is in your sample and here's a name and here's the percent match to it. The problem is is that 
Um, this is all very new, and we don't have percent accuracies. And particularly the database, which I've, over the years, we send off, oh, here's a rare species. You should get this database or put into, have its molecules, you know, announced and put into the database. I've worked with this database for a variety of reasons, and there's lots of junk in it. So it needs to be cleaned up. And so we're, we're still years away from functionally being able to know nothing and just throwing these samples in. There's many, many years of working on what that taxonomic database is before we can have robots with, you know, going through all the DNA of samples and creating the kinds of information that we would want. I, I feel because I doubt very much there's going to be a sea change in the number of taxonomists that you can send specimens to that we are going to um, see a, you know, lots of specimens being pinned up and put into collections. We're going to see this robot thing um, become the way work is done in terms of assessing change. But um, right now, um, there's a lot of tech, little bothersome little details, like is that B that's listed in the database really that B or not? And you know, so that's where the work is. Most of the work is there, and plus the traditional stuff, which is keying things out and comparing it, like you sounds like you've done before. Oh, thank you. I should point out we have this. You can um, just Google it up. The it's called the Handy B Manual. And so if you even have vague interest in how these things are done or who's doing what, we try and cr cr we've created that manual for all the graduate students and different groups who are interested in bees and we discuss collecting, netting, trapping, um, how to prepare specimens, um, the pluses and minuses of visual surveys and other kinds of things. So it's all out there and again you have access to me through email. Yeah. Thanks for the lecture. Do all the native bees sort of live together in harmony or do some not like one another? Well, if you're a, if you're a nest parasite, I, I, you know, um, you can tell that they have, a, don't have a lot of friends because they're um, integumate. So they're, it's, you know, again, the analogies are really different because they're, um, uh, is it keratin or collagen? I think it's keratin based. And they have, they're armored right, to take the stings of the um, other insects where they accidentally run into each other in that dark tunnel. And so they can ball up. Um, even when we're trying to put a pin through them for a specimen, they can be so difficult that it actually takes a lot of effort for us to penetrate that. So that means that it's not all, um, you know, this pleasant society of getting along. Um, for the species that are collecting pollen, you don't really see a lot of interactions. They're not defending their resources. They might jostle each other. Um, honeybees perhaps being the most aggressive of them, which they're in competition. So um, let me just make a, a, a side about honeybees because that's something that gets a lot of, um, that gets addressed a lot. And there's lots of beekeeping associations and I talk to them all the time. So if you like local honey, you need to have honeybees because none of our native species produce honey. If you want pollination, you have, as we spoke about, a bunch of different options. If you're worried about wild plants getting um, enough pollination services, you don't have to worry about that. You don't have to provide honeybees to do that kind of thing. And in fact, you're doing it a disservice um, because of the radical, again, it gets back to this radical lifestyle. Um, they are storing honey not to give to you, but to make it through hard times. Winter and during droughty summer times when floral resources are really low. So that means that they can maintain high populations when nothing is going on. And then when the few flowers that come up, which may be things that have specialist bees on them, they're all over it because, you know, they can just go back and, you know, tank up on some more honey if they can't make it. So there's huge competition at resource limiting time periods between native bees and honeybees. And other times it's relatively open. The native species themselves are so, because they're not storing any resources over time, they basically have no real need to be antagonistic with one another. So there's not, and, and they divide the world up a lot more. So um, each of the species is essentially fractioning out a different component of the floral resource. So I just want to confirm, it, 
So if we have a honeybee hive mm -hmm. in the backyard and we plant a lot of native species, hopefully we have enough balance, but if we don't have a lot of native species, the honeybees may sort of discourage native bees from coming. Um, so honeybees will gladly use native species of plants because they're generalists, ex you know, with their least favorite ones on there. In an urban environment, if you want honeybees, I'm not going to try and discourage you from having honeybees. They're really cool. Native bees aren't completely excluded. They're just is levels of competition. If your concern is more about native species or pollination, I'm just giving you a way of thinking about that that's different. So your key, I'd say here, is in the plant, what you plant. Because if you plant the sort of more traditional clovers, mints, and then uh, some of the um, uh, the ornamental trees, that has relatively little attractiveness to most of the native species. And so you essentially have excluded them right there. If you plant the native species, then the honeybees and the native species have many more opportunities to coexist. Thank you. Does that make sense? Yeah. Hi. Um, weeks ago, I had stopped into one of our local hardware stores and noticed that they were selling these cavity nester bee kits, mm -hmm. the cardboard or parchment paper tubes. And the deal was when you bought the kit, you didn't get the bees. You got like a, a coupon or something and you'd order oh, the, the bees and you would get the bees presumably in the mail or FedEx. Mm -hmm. I don't know. <laughs> I didn't follow up on that part, but my they, question they to send you them, is... Like, follow, they have a little GPS and they <laughs> fly to your house. They could do that. Um, my question is, uh, are you familiar with this at all? But more importantly, is this a good thing or maybe not so good because then aren't we introducing right. non-native species to a region and how would we know one way or the other? So I would say generally not a good thing because if you simply, you could do like I do, you get out your drill and you can get a variety of drill bits and you drill holes in your front porch. <laughs> <laughs> who, who would notice, right? <laughs> And um, so they're lovely to have around, and that's really literally all you need to do. That's the, the main factor. And they'll reuse those holes. There's, um, if we want to get into details, you know, people will get like, well, doesn't it build up parasites? And I can give you um, the story about how, yes, they do, but you'll still have them anyway. Um, but the, um, they'll be colonized, even within these urban areas in Washington, D.C., or all those, all of them have these, a certain set of these mason-using bees. And the fact that you get them from another place brings up just the kinds of concerns that you mentioned, which is um, a lot of the time those are not even native species. So I don't know, I have not heard the specific group that's doing this, but a lot of times you get Osmia cornifrons, which is from the Korean Peninsula, Japan, southern China, that was brought in as a orchard, you know, helper outer, which we really didn't need, another long story. But it's not native. And a lot of times those colonies have pests that also come with them too. And at minimum, it's very difficult to say that the, even if it was a native species, that it would be one from your local area. So all the same arguments about using local um, ecotypes of plants would hold here. So I would say in general, no. But making holes or using their boxes and tubes, if you just put them out, then bees and other little solitary wasps and all kinds of cool things will come on their own. You don't need to have that. So it's not like you won't get anything. Great. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. I learn all kinds of things at these places. <laughs> um, Master gardeners of Santa Clara County have learned about one solution to providing bare soil for native bees, the ground dwellers, uh, filling terracotta pots of different sizes mm -hmm. with soil, um, native soil or whatever, whatever might work, and just putting them out in the, in your, on your property. Uh -huh. and you, above ground or are you sinking it? Above them? ground, uh -huh. sinking it a little bit. Yeah. Into the so stable it's stable, line. but yeah. other than that, so that might work. Have you seen them nesting and using it, or is this a uh, hypothetical? I have. Tr I've, I'm trying. Uh -huh. I haven't seen any so far, but I think it has worked as far as I yeah. know. I mean, I, it sounds promising. Mm -hmm. I, it's the kind of thing that any student in here who's looking for a project should evaluate that kind of 
um, system because I think that would be intriguing and also it's an aesthetic thing, right? Yes. Yeah, so pot sizes and shapes doesn't. You, you can choose. Yeah, you can choose where you want to put it. Yeah. I think some UC um, scientists have um, prescribed this solution as a possibility. Yeah. For yeah, these. I would. I would love to hear about, you know, how people see these things working or mm -hmm. even potentially not working. Right. I can also tell you that another way to get the bare soil is to release children into your yard. I hear you can get them through the mail, but they might not be the right, might not be the right ecotype. I, I know you don't like honeybees, but if you... I actually do. Let me just put this out. I can slam honeybees all day long, but I actually like them. If, if you want them to, to live, if you stopped stealing their honey, wouldn't, they, wouldn't there be fewer colony collapses? So... So I'm two buildings down from the National Honeybee Lab, so we talk all the time. So colony collapse disorder is actually an interesting phenomena. We've heard about it a lot because it's sort of a media, media loves anything with bees, and it just cycles over and over again. Um, so colony collapse disorder is actually rarely now diagnosed. There's a specific set of criteria that have to occur there, and um, the pretty much widely accepted idea is that colony collapse disorder is really a presentation based on a whole variety of different components that have come together to create um, what uh, this diagnosis. So it's not a one thing. So it's not pesticides, it's not um, varroa mites, it's not uh, you know on down the list of pathogens. It's some combination of those things. So pesticides might be weakening the colonies, making them more susceptible, as does um, to um, some, some viral um, pathogens, as does varroa mites, which are generally seen as not a, a something that um, kills them outright, but something that weakens the colonies and makes them more susceptible to a var large variety of other kinds of factors that impact um, that group. So, um, uh, you know, I, again, I give the, I've, I've met a lot of beekeepers because I talk to beekeeping associates all, all the time. And I have to say, I was talking to Leslie here earlier, that they are like fanatics. So I think, I think it's a good thing that they have, they are taking care of honeybees because if they weren't taking care of honeybees, I would be a little concerned about this group of people just out there <laughs> with nothing to do. But they talk about that all the time, you know, how much honey to take off, feeding the bees, you know, it just is a exercise in absolute minutia and passion at the same time. So I can't answer you directly, but just go to a beekeeping association and you'll get an earful of the, the latest conspiracy theories. I should probably stop now. <laughs> Well, thank you for joining us this evening, and I do hope to see you again next month. And thank you to Sam Drogi. Excellent. <laughs>